Check this out. Here's the one I want. This is what I want you to get. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up what? Come on, preach it with me. You cannot be my disciple without giving up what? Everything. In some translations it says all. Everything you own in the New Living Translation. So what you're asking me is to give everything to the church, give my time, give my money, give my resources to the church. No, I'm telling you this is what Jesus said. He says you cannot be my disciple unless you lay down your life and pick up mine. Do what I've called you to do. Be what I've called you to be. You see, in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I'll never forget, ever forget, remembering. That's all or nothing. As they were beating Jesus, as they were beating Him, as they were, I mean, I mean they were, it was, I cannot imagine going through the things that He was going through. I cannot imagine the experiences that he had. I would have to say that the things that Jesus did was all or nothing. As they took this cat of nine tails that had not just glass in it, but bones and metal pieces and stone. You go ahead. Not going? All right. And he took this and he slapped him in the back 40 times. Forty times his his flesh was ripped. He was bleeding. He did all that for you. It was all or nothing. It was everything. He lived his scriptures out loud in front of us. So, help me understand. Why is that so difficult for some people to understand? Did Jesus endure that so that we could come and sing on the stage? Did, he, did God allow His Son, Jesus Christ, to be beat and put upon a cross with nails driven to His hands and to His feet? And then a, 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 for all of the things that happened to Him, did He allow that so that we could just come to church on Sundays and feel good about ourselves? No. It was all or nothing. You see, I remember another story in the Bible in Judges chapter 13, Samson's story. The beginning of this story starts out by saying that this young man was set apart. He was set apart. He was an all or nothing kind of a guy. God chose him to, to, to be an example. God chose him to be an example of life. And he set him apart. Yes, did he have to do certain things? Yes, he couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't do certain things. He couldn't live. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ and, 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 and some of my friends would, were, were kind of picking on me and teasing me and stuff and saying, dude, you, you know what? If you do that and you start going to church like that and you, you really live for God, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do these things that we've been doing. And they start telling me all the things that I couldn't do. Can I tell you what that is? That's religion speaking. That's not Jesus. Because the fact was, it wasn't that I couldn't do those things. I didn't want to do those things right. anymore. Right. I had no desire to do those things. I'd been set free from those things. It didn't matter what it was. It was all or nothing for me. Since that day, I have not gone back and drank anything. I have not gone and taken any drugs. I haven't done anything illegal. I haven't made those mistakes. It was all or nothing. And that was the same thing for Samson. When he made the mistake that he made, he knew at the end of this, it was all or nothing. And as he's standing between those pillars, and he knows, God, if you could just give me one more chance, I'll prove that I'm an all or nothing guy. <clears throat> and then he took out all of his enemies. He took out, the Bible says, more enemies that day than he had in his entire life. But he had to sacrifice his. Now, I'm not telling you these things about death and, 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 and life because God's asking you to give your life. No, we're not jihadists. We're not, we're not in this thing. We're not blowing ourselves up. We're not doing crazy stuff. But we're living a life out loud for Christ. And some people in this world think that's crazy as it is. You are set apart. We must live set apart. You see, God has set you apart because He wants you to be a culture leader. He wants you to preach revivals. He wants you to cast out demons. He wants you to heal sick people. He wants to use you to raise people from the dead. Why, does I, why am I telling you that? Because He said greater things that you will do than I've ever done. He said that about you. Every single one of you have the ability in you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you today. And Jesus himself said, greater things than I ever did, you will do. But it starts with an all or nothing attitude. 
It starts with an all or nothing. You see, you can't give up just some of your struggles in life. I get so sick and tired of people telling me, well, it's just a struggle I have. I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. No. Can, I, can we not just start calling it what it is? Can we stop saying it's a struggle and just call it sin? Because sin is sin. I mean, that's the truth. Let's call sin, sin, and let's be real with it. Because if you're living in sin, Christ cannot be around you. Right. You cannot receive the things that you want to receive. You will never see the blessing. You will never see multiplication if you continue to dabble in the sin. That's all there is to it because sin separates us from Christ. And it's the choice that we make to continue going back to that sin. It's that choice. I remember making that choice and saying, you know what? If I don't give up these things that have caused me to struggle in the past, how many of you want revival? Everybody wants revival. We pray for revival. Can I tell you something? You'll never see revival if we don't make that commitment commitment in that covenant to Christ and live it out loud every single day. That's the truth. you got to give it all. you got to carry the cross. Jesus chose it all. You can look at it in Luke chapter 11 for yourself. But this is what I want you to do. I want to ask yourself this one question as I'm getting ready to close this. Up. Listen to me. Ask yourself this question. What is the level of your commitment? Ask yourself this question personally. What is the level of your commitment? The word commitment means committed. It means entrusted. It means pledging oneself. You see, commitment separates doers from dreamers. That's just all there is to it. In 1 Kings chapter 8, uh, verse 61, in the New International Version, it says this. May your hearts be fully committed. Everybody say fully committed. Fully committed. To the Lord our God, to live by His decrees and obey His commands. I'm having a difficulty here figuring out how we mix that up. How do we misunderstand that? It says, have your hearts be fully committed, live by His decrees, and obey His commands. Where, where's the confusion in that? I don't get it. We must serve God passionately. You know, I tell young people this all the time. I suggest this. I recommend this. I, I, I challenge people all the time to serve God passionately. And the question that I'm starting to get from young people, and this is sad, but it's so true. The question that I get from these young people is, how do I do that? How do I do that? We were speaking to a young lady the other day, and, and I remember they, they were on a mission trip, and, and they went on this mission trip to minister to these young ladies, and, and they were living in a horrible situation, just ridiculous situation. They were orphans and had been orphans their whole lives. And the, and the, living, the, the, the living arrangements where they lived in these orphanages were, it would, it would make you sick to just see it. It would make you sick. Literally, babies. I showed a picture to my wife the other day. Have you ever seen, uh, uh, like in a hospital, when they bring in the food on trays and there's three or four different shelves of food and they're uh, walking it down the hallway to hand out to people in, in, the, in the hospital? They had four babies on top of one of these trays. And on the second shelf, four more babies. And on the third shelf, four more babies. And that's where they slept. They didn't have cribs. They slept on these hospital cars. Four in a row per shelf. It was ridiculous. They didn't have indoor plumbing. They had to go outside. Absolutely horrendous. It was, it was disgusting. Treated horribly. And then when they turned 16 years old, this is what their government does to them. They hand them a check for $36 and a bus ticket back to the home where they were born to, the, the city where they were born to. And say, make it on your own. And immediately in this country, sex traffickers are standing there waiting on these young girls to come off the buses and they immediately put them into sex trafficking. Immediately. By the thousands, these young girls are coming up missing all over, all over this country. By the thousands a year. Because they're released and these sex traffickers are there and they're, they're, they're taking these girls and they know they're coming out of the orphanages and nobody cares about them. Nobody's ever claimed them anyway. Nobody loves them. So they're immediately thrown into this lifestyle. This is happening today, right now. And we met some of these young girls. And I remember the first time some of our missionaries met them and they said, I just want to tell you about Jesus and, and how much He loves you. And you know what their question was? Is who is Jesus and what is love? That's in the world that we live in today. In 2013, there are still people in this world that do not know who Jesus is and they'll never understand what love is. 
But how do you live a life passionately for Christ? You live it by being faithful. You live it by obeying God. You live it by witnessing. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says, Obedience is greater than sacrifice anyway. Can I give you a good example of obedience? There's a young man by the name of Michelangelo. And his first masterpiece, his first artistic masterpiece he created by the age of 21 years old. This dude, everybody knew that he had his stuff to do. He completed the famous statue of David before he was 30 years old. People asked him to paint, but he loved, he, they, people asked him to paint things, but he was a sculptor. He loved sculpting things. He was passionate about sculpting things. He, he feels like, and he even said in, in a book, he said that he was born to sculpt. But his rivals criticized him and said that he could never, never that, that there'd never be another Michelangelo. And, and, and his rivals criticized him about his sculpturing. And he said that it would, he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create something amazing. So he thoroughly committed himself to a project. He thoroughly committed himself to a project. And the project was the leaders of the church came to him and they said, Michelangelo, we know you're a sculptor, but we really would like you to paint in this, in this new building we just built. And we're giving you everything. You have access to anything. If you would paint, we'll make this happen. So people that knew him started criticizing him, saying, dude, you're a sculptor. You're not a painter. Don't do this. Don't do this. So this painting that he painted consisted of this. I've seen this with my own eyes. It's absolutely amazing. He painted the 12 apostles. He also painted over 400 figures. And nine different scenes from the book of Genesis he painted. He painted this, and it took him four years to paint this. How many of you have ever been at, or into, in construction and used scaffolding before? Michelangelo used scaffolding for four years, laying <coughs> on his back 12 inches from the ceiling for four years on his back. It took him four years to paint this. The painting that he did for four years permanently damaged his eyes. But our historians say that the painting that he painted changed art history. But far more reaching than art history, listen to what happened. His level of commitment <coughs> was out of this world. How many of you would be willing to lay on your back for 40 feet? 40 feet in the air. But far greater than art history being impacted was people's lives to this day still being impacted. Because I remember going off into a corner, dark like this, and the intricate details of the painting were just as good as they were right in the middle of the church. And people would ask him, why did you take the time to do that? Way over there, I mean, nobody will ever see it. You know what his answer was? God was here. <coughs> I would have to say that Michelangelo was convinced. I have to say that he believed Proverbs 16 verse 3. And it said, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. You see, commitment to, different, to each person is different. To the boxer is getting off the mat when you've been knocked down three times. That's a commitment. To the person running marathons, the marathoner, it's running another 10 miles when your strength is gone. To the soldier, it's going over the hill not knowing what's waiting on you on the other side. To the missionary is saying goodbye to your own comforts and your own family to make it better for other people. But I want you to understand something. As a Christian, we should be all of these. We should be a fighter. When you get knocked down, get back up. When you've run your last mile, know you can do ten more. You got to know that when you're a, when you're a Christian, you got to be a soldier, not knowing what's on the other side of that hill, but you got to keep going. You got to be a missionary taking what you desire to be done and what your plans are and saying goodbye to your own comforts and giving it up for other people's comfort. You see, commitment is different. I asked my sons this morning, as my wife uh, fixed some breakfast for me, and I had eggs this morning, and I had bacon. And I asked my kids, I said, you know what? As I was preparing for this message, I said, I asked Brett, and I asked Zach, and I asked Drady, and I said, hey, which one committed more, the chicken or the pig? Got too many chickens in the church today. <laughs> Think about that one for a minute. You see, commitment's a whole lot different to the pig than it is to the chicken. 
We must be fighters. We must be marathon runners. We must be soldiers. We must be missionaries. You see, because true commitment inspires and attracts people. You want your church to grow? Be committed. Because true commitment inspires and attracts people. People will come from everywhere. You see, commitment starts in the heart. In the Kentucky Derby, the winning, the winning horse runs out of oxygen the first half mile of the race and then runs the rest of the race on his heart because he's been trained his whole entire life to win this race. He runs out of oxygen the first half mile. Michael Jordan says it better than anybody. He says, heart separates the good from the great. And that's the truth. I believe that. You see, if you want to make a difference in life, in other people's lives, look into the heart to see if you're really committed. You ever seen the movie Schindler's List? It's an absolutely amazing movie. It's a man that made a commitment to save the lives of people he had no reason to save. And he was committed to the end. He proved true commitment. You see, commitment is tested by action. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as if working for the Lord, not for men. I pray this over my kids every day before we go to school. I tell it to them. I tell my baseball team when we're praying before our games because anybody that plays on my team, they know we're going to pray on my team. If you don't like it, get off the team. I'll find you somewhere else to go because I'm a Christian. We're going to pray. And I tell them right there at the beginning of the season, and I pray this over my kids. Don't do this because I'm your coach. Don't do this for your mom and dad screaming in the stands. Do it because you're doing it for the Lord, and you're giving him everything that you're going to get. You see, the only real measure of commitment is action. Did you hear that? Yeah. And getting up out of bed at 9 o'clock in the morning on Sundays and showing up here with, a, with, with your hair half combed and, and your shirt tail tucked in, isn't full commitment. <laughs> I used to tell our students in Master's Commission this all the time. If it's not a lifestyle, it's a lie. Being a Christian, it's either a lifestyle or it's a lie. I remember a, I remember a, a song that was written by uh, DC Talk many, many years ago. And the, and the name of this song was, What If I Stumble? And at the beginning of this song, there was a part in this song that said, the single most, I'm trying to remember how it goes. The single, most, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. <coughs> to talk about God and act, act like they're Christians inside the walls of the church and then walk out the doors of the church and live completely different. And then it went on to say, that's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. <coughs> that's the truth. The lack of commitment. We sang a song about it this morning that we were singing about praising God in church on Sunday and then on Monday you can't even find your Bible. Your Bible should be right here because you've got it so committed to who you are. Right. Commitment opens the doors for achievement. If you want to get anywhere in life worthwhile, you must be committed. I'm going to close with this. Let's listen to me real quick. Because it's about order. It's about blessing. It's about multiplication. But all of that starts with a committed lifestyle. There are four types of people in the world today. Everybody in this room, you read one of these four. There's no way, no way around it. You write these down if you want to. You can listen to it. But each one of us are one of the following. Number one. Number one, you're a cop-out. People who have no goals and do not commit. Number two, holdouts. People who don't know if they can accomplish their goals, so they're afraid to commit. No people like that. <coughs> Peter would have been like that if he hadn't passed out that bread. Number three, dropouts. People who start towards a goal but quit when the going gets tough. Number four is what every single one of us as Christians should be is all outs. People who set goals commit to them, and then pay the price to reach them. <coughs> so my question is this. Which kind of person are you? What kind of Christian are you? Where are you? <coughs> you see, Christ is not valued at all unless he's valued above all. And that's the truth. A friend of mine had a dream several years ago, and he told me about it, and it rocked my world. And this dream was about this girl that we heard about in church. This young girl that lived in the Middle East, she was eight years old. Her family has always been Muslim family. Her entire life, all she knew was the Muslim faith. But then one day they ran into and they encountered a Christian missionary. 
and her family was turned, her immediate family was rocked for Jesus. They changed their faith. They changed their way of living. They started living for Christ. They had to do it secretively. They had to, they had to, they, they didn't want anybody to know at first because they knew that what this meant in their country, they knew what this meant in their region, that if people found out that they had converted from Islam to Christianity, that they would immediately be killed. So we're being told this story and we're listening to this story. And, and, and my friend says, do you remember that girl that, 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 that they were telling us about? And I said, yeah, I remember. He said, and the story went on to say that they finally found out about it. Her father was killed right in front of her. Her mother was raped and tortured and killed right in front of her. And then they took this little girl and they literally, this little eight-year-old girl, and they told her, if you, don't denounce, if you don't renounce Christ now, we will kill you and the rest of your brothers and sisters. She said, I can't do it. What Jesus did for me, I can't do it. What Jesus went through for me, I cannot do it. So what these evil men did is they immediately, right there in front of her brothers, they cut her arm off and threw it into a lion's den. And she's sitting there in agonizing pain. And she's sitting there hurting. And they said, you've got to renounce Christ. She went not do it. They cut her other arm off. She's bleeding to death. Her brothers and sisters are crying, asking them, begging them to stop. And they say, we're not going to stop. They threw her into the lion's den and the lions devoured her dead. An eight-year-old little girl who gave her life, who was an all or nothing woman of God, went to her death saying, I love Jesus. My friend told me, do you remember that girl? I said, yeah, I remember the story. I remember about it. He said, I had a dream about it last night. I said, really, what was it about? He said, I dreamed you were in heaven. And I dreamed she, I met this little girl. And I dreamed we started talking about life. And we started talking about how she grew up. We started talking about what, what she did in her life and how she was born and raised in the Islamic faith. And he said, it was just like I was there. It's just like I knew her. I saw her face and everything. He said, I met this little girl. And then we sat down to eat dinner. And she's telling me about what she did. She told me about when they killed her mom. She's sitting right there at dinner and we're eating a meal together. In my dream, she's telling me about her mother being brutally killed. She's telling me about her father being brutally killed. She's telling me about herself being thrown into a lion's den. We're in heaven and her body's glorified. She's got her full body and she's beautiful. But she's telling me about what she did for Jesus. And then this eight-year-old little girl looked at my friend in his dream and said, What did you do? He was living half-hearted for God. He was One Sunday he would go to church, the next week he would go out and party. The next Sunday he would come back to church and then he would go out and do some of the things that he wasn't supposed to do. That's my question. From an eight-year-old little girl that was killed for her faith, what are you doing for Jesus? What's the level of your commitment? You guys happen to have that one video you can't do it. That's the question I want to ask you. If you want to see multiplication, it starts with you. It starts with you, the individual. If you want to see multiplication in the body of Christ, it starts with you. This church is going somewhere. These people in this church have a passion for Christ. They want to see something happen. They want to see the lost reach for Jesus. They want to see the hurting brought in here and healed. They want to see the sick healed. The leaders of this church believe that God, greater is He that's in them than He that is in the world. If you believe that, you've got to start living that. What's the level of your commitment? You see, because I'm asking you about commitment because I'm asking you, is your life in order? Because if your life's not in order, there won't be any blessing. And you'll be one of those, one of those people that never see the miracle of multiplication. I want to see the miracle of multiplication. I want to see the, the miracle of multiplication because you see, if we truly did 
what Jesus has called us to do, the very last thing He called us to do was to go and make disciples. The very last thing He told us to do was go and make disciples. I personally believe that we should make that our number one priority. I could ask you the question, not just what, what's the level of your commitment, not just what are you doing for Jesus, but how many disciples do you have right now? How many people are you personally discipling right now? If you're a believer in Christ and you love Jesus with all your heart, and you're committed to this church, you're committed to the vision of this church, you're committed to the vision of, of the body of Christ, how many people are you discipling right now? Because that's where multiplication comes from. That's where it comes from. You will die your head before you guys. commitment to your, 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 your family isn't what it needs to be. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to challenge you. What's the level of your commitment? You see, because it's not just about this church. It's not just about what's going on in this building. You see, we're not a cult. We're a movement. And this movement is a discipleship movement. The body of Christ is to make disciples. If we truly made disciples the way that Christ intended us to, we can realistically disciple the entire population of the world in less than seven years. If you don't believe me, I could show you how. See, if, you live, if you're in this room and you've lived under a generational curse, your family's been cursed, and, and, and you, you, you want to just be blessed, God wants to deliver you. God wants to set you free from that. You see, for, for, the, for the individual, I want to pray for that. I want to pray for your life to come in order. I want to pray for your life to get to become more committed. I want to pray for you to become more committed to the body of Christ, to the works of Christ. You see, for the future of this church, for the entire collective body, I want to see not just the opportunity to grow out to a property on the, on the highway, but I want to see you do greater things than he's done. <clears throat> because that's what he's promised. Anybody can build a building. The Muslims do it all the time. The Hindus do it all the time. The Buddhists do it all the time. Anybody can build a building. A religious institution. But what are you doing for Jesus? If you're in this place today, I want you to ask yourself that question. What is the level of my you're not satisfied with your answer, I want you to think about that young girl. What have you done for Jesus? How did you live your life? You can imagine we're going to get to heaven and have those kind of conversations. When we go to conferences and conventions, we ask people all the time, what's going on lately? What, tell me the latest in your life. What's happening? And we hear all the good stories. But then there's going to be times when we get to heaven, they're going to tell us some stories that we're not going to be able to live with. And we're going to check, ask ourselves, I wish I could have done more. Don't get to the end of your life and say, I wish I could have done more. Do more now. Yes. Yes. Don't live your life with regrets. Tell God right now, I want to make a full commitment to you. 